Okay, you can see that I'm getting settled in. I invite you to do the same, to just get settled in for what we're going to do today. If you have an outline when you walked in today, uh, you may want to get that out and, and give you an opportunity to write some notes on that. Uh, we will go through a lot of scriptures this morning. Um, and so a lot of those will be on the screen for you, uh, but you're able to uh, write those things down. And hopefully as you're writing things down that the Lord would just speak in our time together and you'd be able to write down on a piece of paper a very personal word for your life, for your family uh, today. This format that we're going to go through today is very practical. This is a very practical way for you to implement uh, one, the things that we've talked about, about prayer, into your own quiet time with the Lord. And uh, I preached Ephesians six eighteen last week and uh, you, a lot of elements are mentioned regarding prayer in that. Uh, verse and many other verses that we referenced, and uh, this is a way that you can bring all those things in. I'm going to remind you of Ephesians 6, 18 and what it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Diligence is required when it concerns prayer. Diligence, discipline to Pray always. It's going to take intentional effort on your end and on my end. It's going to require time. It's going to require devotion. But it's going to bring about spiritual growth in your life. Spiritual growth in such a way that it is evident to others. In fact, it will be evident to those who have a front row seat to your life. In fact, just here recently, um, my daughter Daisy... She comes, she knows where I go for my prayer time, and she gets out of her bed, comes there, and the, one of the things she said to me, she goes, Dad, I got out of my bed and got out on my knees and prayed just like you. And I'll tell you, there is nothing more satisfying. That'll make your day right there as a parent. And a little kid. People observe it. They can see it. It's observed. Spiritual growth is observable to those in your life. And when you take prayer seriously, you take this discipline seriously, it will bring about spiritual growth and people will notice. Listen to 1 Timothy 4, verse 7. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Hear what Paul's telling Timothy there? Effort. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. He begins giving some more exhortations there. You skip down to verse 15. He says this, Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Progress is, there's evidence that comes with it. Where people know that you're growing. People can see that you're growing. And he gives Timothy a list there. First Timothy is very powerful about godliness, what it looks like, practical, and way it brings about the spiritual growth and its evidence in your life. I think of my pastor. He went home to be with the Lord during 2020 during, because of COVID. One of the things that happened to him was and why COVID was so hard on his body is he had underlying health sy symptoms. And uh, he had donated... A, a, he received a kidney donation early in his life. So he's one kidney. He had to take a lot of medicine because of that and a lot of complications health-wise that he had for the, the majority of his life. Physically, you could tell he looked weak. Pieces of his neck were missing from cancer areas that were taken off on his face. And the, 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 the medicine he would have to take did a lot of different things to his body. Physically, he was very weak. But I'll tell you this, when this man walked in the room, his progress because of his godliness was evident. This man's strength in the Lord to anybody who knew him, although physically weak, he exercised himself into godliness in such a way that it was evident to all, to, to his church, to those who knew him. I mean, he was a spiritual giant casting a very long shadow when he walked in the room. Although physically weak, he brought about bodily, this physical bodily uh, exercise in, in the spiritual realm that brought about spiritual growth that was evident uh, to all. I talked about hazers, 
spiritual strongholds. When we looked at Judges chapter 4 with Deborah and her raising up Barak uh, to fight these spiritual strongholds. I'm telling you, when you grow spiritually, and it happens a lot through your prayer time with the Lord, spiritual strongholds, the hazers in your life, they are no match for a man or woman tapping into the strength of God. They are no match. They were no match for that man I've seen and, and I watched in his life, but for your life and my life as well. Spiritual strongholds crumble when you have the strength of Almighty God flowing through your life. And prayer is one of the great ways where we tap into it. You know, Satan, I don't know that he's concerned that we just come to church. I don't know he's as concerned that you give your money. I don't know that he's as concerned, even if you give up a little bit more time and come to Sunday school. But you get on your knees and on your face before God, I guarantee you, you're going to attract attention from your enemy because you're attracting power that's going to be flowed through your life that is no match for him. But on our own, really what Jesus said, we can do nothing. My pastor, uh, I greatly and dearly miss him. One of the things that I think about him when I think about the, what we're doing today, I do think of him. And he spoke at my ordination service, 13 points. You've got a lot of points on your outline right there, but that's not 13 of them. I got 13 points during my ordination service, and he preached every one of them, but there was one that just rises to the top above them all, and this is what he said, you're worth no more to God in public than you are to him in private. That's worth you hearing today twice. You're worth no more to God in public than you are to him in private. Your fellowship with God is where everything else flows from. Everything in your life and my life comes through our fellowship with Almighty God. And what I've learned from doing what I'm about to do with you today, I've been doing this for many years now. Uh, one thing I've learned more than anything, meeting with God in the secret place, having fellowship with him is where significance, where you make a difference for God in the public arena. It happens in the private area in your life and in my life, abiding in Christ. John 15, 5, abiding in him. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit, but apart from me, what? You can do nothing. Before you go and feed others, you're going to have to come and eat at the Lord's table yourself. And you need to know how to do that. So today, the title of our prayer service is a spiritual workout. So we're going to get a workout. I'm about to get a double one today, so I'm going to get two workouts in. Uh, but this is a spiritual workout let me read to you Matthew 6, verse 5. Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The first point you have on your outline out there is a time for the commitment. Jesus says when you pray. Not if you pray. Not that, you know, maybe if you think about it when you should, and you should pray. When you, this commitment for a believer in Jesus Christ as a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ, a commitment to pray is assumed. When you pray. And we get instructions right there in Matthew 6 on how to do this. Uh, go into a secret place, an inner room. Let me give you some suggestions for this. You need to have a time selected. You need to select a time and a place that will be uninterrupted for you to meet with the Father. Where no one else can come in, where no one else can bother you. This may require for you to get creative, and you are going to have to think through that. But you need to have this down in your house, what time I'm going to meet with him. How many of you have ever made a doctor's appointment before? Or a dentist appointment, just raise your hand, uh, any kind of appointment. So you know how to make an appointment then. We all just raise our hands. So you do know how to make an appointment. This is about making an appointment with God, that I am going to meet with him. And when you make any other appointment in your life, you do some things. You select a time. There's a place that you're going to go to for that appointment. And then the next thing you do is then everything is arranged around that appointment. So if your appointment is in the morning, and mine, mine is very early, long before I ever want to get up, I get up.
online. Hey, it's, thank you, JT. Let's give JT a round of applause. Thank you. Appreciate you, man. Where were we? Interruptions. That's where we were, right. You don't want to have interruptions in your quiet time. So if it's going to be in the morning and you know you're not a morning person, I'm not a morning person. Put your alarm by a cup of coffee that's going to be made uh, if your coffee maker will do that. Put it on the other side of the room. Do whatever you got to do, but exercise yourself. Some of these things means we're doing things we don't particularly like to do, but you will be glad that you did them once you do them. And so uh, you will find that as you do this, there will be adjustments that might need to be made along the way. But set the time, set the place uninterrupted, and then you guard it. So if it is in the morning, then you make adjustments the night before. Anytime you have an appointment in your life, you, you, you change some stuff. This is your greatest appointment that you can make and that you can have. You're meeting with Almighty God. That's why you were created. That's why you're on this earth, to know him. It's why Jesus Christ died for you, that you may know him, to walk with him. And so prepare in advance. Be intentional about this. When you go to this appointment, like you would at other appointments, maybe you bring paperwork or whatever, depending on the appointment you go to, you need to bring your Bible have your Bible, have a notepad, and have a journal. And what you're doing by doing this, you're anticipating a word from the Lord. A lot of times people think, and there's a kind of a misconception about there about quiet times and prayer and have this time with him. It's a place where we go and, and pour out all our heart. Well, there's times that we may do that in a quiet time, but we are going to pray with open ears, not necessarily open mouths. There's many of scriptures that speak about let our words be few. Be silent before him. We are not coming to, this, to the Lord's table to get across our agenda. We are going to the Lord's table that his agenda might be our own, that his will might be our will. We have our own garden of Gethsemane where we die and we are open ears to what he would want us to do. So we come to listen. We come to hear. And by doing, by bringing a notepad, by bringing the Bible, we are communicating to God, I'm expecting that you would speak to me today. Here I am. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. That's what we are communicating and we are going. And it's a real relationship with a real God who really does speak. That'll revolutionize your prayer time, recognizing that as well. So we got a time of commitment we we set to go before the Lord. Well, what do we do? How do we begin? There's, here's some just elements that um, I think could help you. They're not original with me, but they are biblical principles uh, that you can implement in your prayer time. And so here's the, the, the next one that we have for you. You want to have a time of praise, a time for praise. This will focus your attention on Almighty God and get it off yourself. I'm going to read to you Revelation chapter 4. Verses 1 through 11. So a few verses here, but I want you to just listen. Revelation 4, verse 1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the throne I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and burnings before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four li living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever. 
and cast their thrones before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now that'll get your mind's eye off yourself, won't it? You come to the throne with praise, and what we are doing, we are joining in on the praise that's going on right now. Did you hear that part? It says, there's angels in heaven that do not rest day or night, constantly before the thrones, crying out over and over again. Happened when you got up, when we go to bed tonight, going on right now, angels specifically created to be in the very presence of God, to not rest day or night. You might say, oh, that's how boring could that be? This is, they're crying it out in such a way as if they've never cried it before. It's fresh every time. How could it not be in the very presence of God? When you step into your quiet time and prayer time, you need to realize the arena you're stepping into. The arena we step into when we pray, we just read about it. We go and we praise God for who he is. And you see this all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New. When the veil is pulled back a little bit and we can peer in the throne room, you see praise going on. And when men and women on earth get a chance to glimpse that, you know what they do? They then fall down in praise. Isaiah 6 verse 1 says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and on the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. This will help you get a proper acknowledgement perspective of who you are when you go to him in his presence. This takes all the attention off of ourself and puts it on him where it belongs. It is not about us. Life is not about us. Nothing is about us. God does things for his glory. He created things for his glory. It's all for him. So let's just take a moment right now, would you? And let's just put some attention on him. Would you bow your heads and hearts? And we'll just give you a few moments for our time of praise. Maybe some things brought to your mind right then that you could praise him for. And I'll give you some examples You could focus on the fact that he's creator, provider. God is the owner and sustainer. You could praise him that he's in absolute control of everything. Lord, we praise you. You are on your throne high and lifted up. You are exalted on high. We exalt you in our hearts, O God. There is none higher. There is none greater. We love you and adore you. We thank you that you are the God who sees. You are the God who hears. You are the God who receives our praise. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We need to have a time for praise. I encourage you during this time in your own, use music. I would use music. Uh, If that helps, it helps me. Uh, Brittany often hears mine coming through the baby monitor. She knows what I'm listening to. Maybe that doesn't help you. I don't know. But we need to get a keen sense of his awareness. Music, I don't know of a greater tool God's created than to do that, to get our minds on him and to praise him. 
focus on him. And then as you praise, I kind of like to observe and listen maybe what's going on in that throne room. Lord, let me hear. I heard it. Even there, I'm wanting him to open my heart and my ears. We need a time for thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and praise go together. Listen to Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter his, into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So how do we come? Praise and thanksgiving are wrapped together. That is the appropriate way for us, for you and I, to go to his presence. Be thankful to him and bless his name. We need to be thankful for what God has done for us and acknowledge what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. If you have nothing to thank God for, you would have to wonder, have you received what he has done for you? Thanksgiving is a natural, innate part of a believer's life, to be thankful. You may recall a story in Luke 17 about ten lepers. Ten lepers, they all had leprosy, this deadly disease that just decayed your body. And as Jesus was passing on, these ten lepers had heard some stories about Jesus and his ministry, and he's far away, but now all of a sudden Jesus is coming close. And so what they began to do is they cried out for mercy. All ten of them, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And they're crying out. They're outcasts of society. They were called to cry out, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, which meant get back, I have leprosy. And now this cry is trying, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. What you've done for others out there, do it, do it in my life. And Jesus answered. Jesus spoke. He gave a very clear command. He says, go your way. That's kind of shocking. He would think, he would just say, be cleared of leprosy. But he says, no, go your way and show yourself to the priest. Well, that's kind of absurd, does it not? That, well, what about this? Go your way and show yourself. So they obeyed, all ten of them. And as they went, it says... They were cleansed. They were healed of their leprosy. But how many came back? You know the story. Only one. Luke 17, 15 says this. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. That's a way to praise him. And fell down on his feet, on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. You know what Jesus would say after that? Weren't there, weren't there ten? Where are the nine? Let me ask you a serious question today. Are you among the nine? This helps you become one of ten when you get on your face before God and you thank him for what Jesus has done for you. And I don't know about you, I, you, you can't do that enough. Eternal life, forgiveness of sins, cleansing you, what he's done for you, getting you through challenges, adversity, people he's put in your life, promises, blessings. Be specific during this time. Spend genuine time thanking God. That's an appropriate way for us to enter into his presence, to enter into his gates with praise and thanks giving. You got a spouse next to you, you could squeeze her or him and be like, I thank God for him. Or thank God for my wife. Thank God for my husband. But everybody in this room, you have something to be thankful for. Let's spend some time right now and let's get specific. Would you bow your heads and would you just spend some time right now thanking God? Be very specific.
Lord, thank you for the immeasurable gift of your Holy Spirit that you placed in us the moment we were born again, applying what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross to our life, to our soul. We can never say thank you enough. Eternity is not long enough, Lord, to cling to your feet and say thank you. Thank you for things that you have done in our lives that already today that we, we didn't even see. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, even in our world. Other and others' lives who are coming to know you. We don't see those things on the news, but Lord, we know you are always moving and working around us. We thank you for working in our lives. We love you, God. We also need a moment for a time for confession. Listen to Psalm 139, 23 through 24. David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You hear what David's asking? Of an infinite, omniscient God who knows everything, and he's saying, Lord, take all of that, who you are, and you come search me out. Why do we need to do that? Because there's things in our own lives that we can't even see. Or Jesus wouldn't have to say, before you remove the speck from somebody else's eye, what does he say? Get the log out of your own. We miss logs. There's, we, we miss lots of things in our own lives, but I'm telling you, on a daily basis, we come before the Lord, search my own life, search my own heart, search me, Lord, and surface anything that is displeasing to you. Bring up anything in my life, Lord, that it would bring shame to your name, that would hinder my effectiveness, that would hinder you accomplishing your perfect will through my life. This will take time. You take time and you listen and you search and you ask God to search. And then you address whatever he brings up. You have a house full of several kids. You try to do things there to limit TV use and all of those other things. And so you find crazy games you do around the house. Well, hide and seek is one of our games that we play at our house. Problem is, I'm using all my, my kids are making their way in the illustrations today, so just, you just get ready for that. But our little one, Jet, he gives everybody away. And so especially me. He comes in with his pacifier and he's sucking it, and whoever's supposed to find me, he just points at me and does this. And shows everybody where I'm at. So the game has evolved and developed, because Jet's picking up on skills. So now it's hide and seek in the dark. And so now we turn off all the lights in the house, and they get a flashlight, and then I'll go hide, and they got to come find me. Well, I go into Daisy's room, and her bed is kind of elevated a little bit, and I got up underneath there, got tucked into a corner, and they were supposed to count. Mom helps them with that, and when they're done, they go find Dad, and they get their flashlights, and off they go. This is what we do. Daisy comes into her room, and after one second, she goes, not in here, turns around, and then leaves. And I thought, that's, that's as much effort as you're going to put into that? But you know, the Christians, when we go before the Lord, sometimes we don't put much more effort than that either. You're going to go in the fullness of God's presence for one or two seconds, even two minutes, and think, oh, I've examined myself before the Lord, and I've done my job. Nothing here. I'm going to get up my own way. No, we have not examined enough. No, we need to go before the Lord and say, there is something here, Lord. You get your spotlight out. You get your searchlight out, and you search all of me, because there's something here, Lord, that I know that needs to be addressed. Sometimes it's it's something in your fellowship that fills off that'll drive you there. And you're like, Lord, what, what is it? I'm missing it. And I'm just, I'm planning my whole time this morning just for you to show me that. 
I have found that when God does bring stuff up in your life, he, he digs deep into your past. And with God, I've also found there's no statute of limitations with him. Like, Lord, that's clearly, that was a long time ago, so like, we good on that, right? I have discovered over and again, my wife has discovered over and over again, because she's married to someone who has a past, a colorful one, and she gets brought up into it a lot, especially when I come out of this portion of my quiet time. I shared with you weeks back about a divine encounter when I I was in Canton at first Monday. Maybe you recall that. A woman got led to the Lord. Uh, She was late in her life, and she, she prayed, and and uh, to receive Christ right in front of her booth. It was awesome and got to share about that. And I told you, but there was something that brought me out there, and I'll tell you about that when it comes. Well, that time has come for me to tell you what actually brought me out there. That was on a Saturday morning, but on Friday, we needed to kill some time from picking Colton up at school. And so we were out there. It happened to be first Monday weekend, so we thought, we'll stop in here and we'll walk around and mosey and just browse. So we do so. As I'm doing that, I see one of these buildings. There's buildings out there. If you're not familiar with it, you walk in shops. It's, I don't know. But I walk, and I see this one particular building, and all of a sudden, this flashback memory comes to my mind of about being about 16, 17 years old. And I jacked a guy's golf club who was selling golf clubs. What I mean by that is I stole it. I robbed him of a golf club that he could have sold for money. And when that, my, I've been out there many of times since then. There was something about this time, though, when I saw that building, and it just, I don't know what, it was just right, and it just, that just came to my mind. And all I did, my wife didn't know it, my kids don't know it, we're pushing them in the wagon, and, but, man, it just hit me. And what I did in that moment, I just kind of cringed and thought, oh, gosh, I, I'm terrible. How lost I was. Just... I just cringed and was just, I put it away. I didn't even tell Brittany that that thought even came to my mind. We just kept, we just kept walking. Well, that was when we first got there. We, we were moseying around. Well, now there's a woman that's coming by. There's not a lot of people out there during this time we were in. It was Friday, and this woman comes by with a golf club, a little one. And I was wanting to, uh, you know, while we're out there, in my mind, like, to, you know, I want to hit golf balls with John Luke and with Jet one day, and so I was looking for a little golf club, and uh, this woman has a little golf club in her hand, and, and she walks by, and I said, where did you find that? Is that, is there someone out here selling golf clubs? And she was like, oh yeah. She stops. The most outgoing woman I've ever met in my life draws the most specific map to where to go to get a golf club. And as she's doing it, she's setting things down. We stopped in the middle of the aisle, and she's going, she's talkative, and and all this stuff about the golf club and where where it's at. And I was like, no trouble. You can just point us in the general direction. Like, you're good. You don't have to draw us a map. And she's like, no, no, I need to draw you a map. And and just, we spent probably 10 minutes right there in that aisleway of of her giving us a specific map to that place. I was like, okay, so we go on over there. Well, it's Friday, and you know, and it's kind of late in the afternoon now. Now it's they're they're closing, they're closing down. So uh, he, I guess it was wasn't busy that day, and so they, this guy's closing up early. And now we walked by, and, and uh, he was like, "Yeah, I'm closed, but you now I'll, I'll be out here tomorrow." And I thought, oh, "Okay, no worries." So we're we're leaving, and uh, and I'm thinking, you know, I wonder, could that be that same guy from that? memory I had from when I, and I thought, no, man, that was a long time ago. I was 16 years old. That wasn't even the right, he wasn't even that right spot. So I was like, I put it away again. Saturday morning, I go for my spiritual workout. I do this every day. I go on Saturday morning in my time. I'm doing this. I I'm a, We're going to get to it, I promise, but the time where we pray for the lost, the time where we pray for others, And I have a lot of lost people I go and I want to pray for. I've had these heavy burdens. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to get up and pray for all of those things. But here's the deal. You know what's on my mind? This gigantic burden about this golf club. I can't get anything else out. 
I'm not even really praising and thanking God like I was thinking I was going to. I'm like, all of a sudden, my soul has weight on it now about this golf club. And I thought, Lord, what do you want me to do with that? I don't know if that was the right guy or not. I don't know. What do you want me to do with this? And I'm just, I'm there. I'm on my knees. And then I move, I change positions now, face on the floor. Like, I'm just miserable. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Go back out there? Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's the guy. And it just came to my mind. Well, I drew you a map right to him. And I thought, and when that thought came to my head, I thought, gosh, I'm going back to Canton. And then I'm thinking, I'm going to have to explain to Brittany why I need to go back to Canton. And then I'm thinking, what is pleasing to you for me to fix this? I don't know. I have a golf club in my golf bag that I don't know if that was the same club. I don't think it was, but I'm I'm thinking, okay, I think I'll I'll return that. And then an, an amount comes to my mind about money about what I need to do to make amends for this. And so I get the amount in my head and with the Lord and get a green light on that. And I'm thinking, okay. And now my worst nightmare is coming a little bit because I know I'm going to tell Brittany, like our plans that we thought we had this weekend are going to be, there's a wrinkle to our plans now. I'll shorten this story. Brittany comes out. We have a great talk. And she's, she's by the way, there's been many of these. I'm sorry to let you down in any way, but there's been many of these. You could ask her. Don't ask her. There's, there's, but there's many. So she's like, okay, we're going to Canton. I'm telling you, I'm sick to my stomach all the way there. It's not a short drive either. So from Sigaville to Canton, I'm driving out there, and I'm miserable. I'm, I'm driving out there. I'm, I'm thinking of what is this guy going to think, and uh, our kids are with us and stuff. I don't know how to, like, handle that either, and I'm just, but I'm like, I got to do this. I got to take care of this. We go right, we, we have our map that the lady drew, and that was either an angel or the most outgoing woman I've ever met in my entire life. I'm, my conviction is an angel. But I go, and I introduce myself to this guy, and he looks at me like I'm crazy. And I said, sir, do you, did you have a golf stand in a, in a building back here? And I kind of pointed, and he goes, what's your point? That's all he said. He didn't say yes or no, and I just thought, I'll take that as a yes. Sir, I... I was 16 years old. I took a go- I robbed you of a golf club. I'm here to make that right. I'm a follower of Jesus now. I'm sorry I've done that, and I'm here to make that right. And I have a golf club, and I have, I have some money I want to give you. And I'll spare you more details, but we, we wrestled a little bit, and I, I was able to get him to accept that. I wasn't leaving out there until that was done. The problem was this man felt so bad he wanted to give them a golf club. And so he gave him a little golf club, and uh, as I'm walking away, I'm realizing I'm t- because of that little golf I'm $20 off of the amount I had in my mind that morning. So w- we walk away, and Brittany goes, what's wrong? I was like, I don't know. This ain't right. She was like, okay, let's go. So we circle back around. I said, she gets her, I said, give me the envelope. It's got our grocery money in it, our grocery fund. I said, I, I, I need $20 of the grocery money. Here. Take it. I go back to that guy. Here it is. And he, again, looks at me like I'm even crazier because I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. This, I need to be released from this. Just take it. And I just walked away. It's yours. But as I walk back and I meet Brittany, I'm telling you, fellowship with God, the weight I was feeling that was crushing me that morning, was gone, I'm talking, restored in such a way, I, I have tears rolling down my eyes. And I began to, I'm praising and thanking God like, like I wanted to that morning. Not only that, but I'm telling Brittany, thank you for putting up in the grace and mercy what you had to deal with being married to this guy. And then she begins to like talk about, you know, I had an issue with a sweater one time that I didn't even realize that I had to deal with once from, from college after I got saved. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. We're sitting here talking. Our intimacy is growing. Our intimacy with God. I'm talking, I don't know what's going on around us. It's Saturday. It is busy now. But we're walking and we're praising and thanking God. Like, it was awesome. In fact, I had sunglasses on and I wasn't going to remove them because my eyes were red. And I'm walking. I'm just like, thank you. This is what I was, what I got right then was what I was wanting that morning. I was just like, oh, you're so good. Thank you. And then off comes a voice. To my right, that says, 
I think your kids need some candy. We're like, what? And so we come over, and that's where we end up meeting this woman and share the gospel with her. And she prays to receive Christ right there in front of her stand. My drive home was much different than my drive there. I'm telling you this. This is a crucial aspect of your quiet time with God. Cleansing. You've heard me say this before, but the greatest piece of furniture in your house is your trash can. Not your couch, not your refrigerator. If you don't maintain the trash can in your house, you've got problems. We need to maintain this area of our life, cleansing. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The apostle John said, if we, not if you, not if those people, he included himself. If we confess our sins, just because you're a believer in Jesus Christ doesn't mean you don't still have things to dress and deal with. Your effectiveness is restored. Your, your fellowship is restored. Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. I love this part. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Effectiveness. This has everything to do with our effectiveness, our cleansing. Matthew 5, 23 through 24 says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. By the way, if you come to your act of worship and you there remember, you just coincident, you just happen to remember something there, that is no coincidence. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit to you and I is to bring to remembrance. In fact, it specifically says that concerning the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John. To bring to our remembrance. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. If there's something not right, that then becomes more important than your act of worship. There may be lost people to pray for. There may be things to do. But the Bible says, leave your gift there. God cares more about this being taken care of. That's the matter of urgency. It becomes more priority than the church gathering. In fact, if we have fellowship issues among us, yet we gather together as a church, I don't know that the Lord cares about that at all. I think gifts need to be laid down and go. Be, reconciliation needs to take place. Effectiveness needs to be restored. Our church body needs this. You need this. I need this. We need to maintain this. Let's go before the Lord's searchlight right now. Would you bow your heads? Maybe God has brought something up already. If he has, address that in whatever way that you can right now. It may just be 1 John 1, 9. It may involve you being reconciled to someone in this room. If there is nothing coming up and you're like, I don't know, Ask God to search you. We should not be too audacious to think there's nothing worth pointing out in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would create in us a clean heart. We pray that you would help us as a body to lift up clean hands before you. 
our hands have been defiled in any way. There's something hindering our effectiveness. God, please show us that. The Lord Jesus says that he walks in the midst of the lampstand. He knows our works. Or bring it out, whatever it may be, that we might address it. That we would find our cleansing today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, for some people looking on the outside in, they might think, man, that's crazy that y'all would tear down a building. That you would go back in the past and remove something. But you know why we did that? What we just talked about right there. Something in the past to have to go back and address it. That was holding us back from our effectiveness. And God overwhelmed us with it. Wouldn't let us get away from it. And then even provided a way for us to do it. But just because we dealt with that. Don't mean there's more things in our own lives as a church body that we need to address. I would encourage you in your own quiet times to be praying for our church body and our church family on this area. We need a time for yielding. Romans 6.11 says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We need to have a funeral every morning. And when you go into your quiet time, you're going to a funeral service. You're going to die. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We spend a lot of time on, that's verses one through two. We spend a lot of time on verses three through eight, the spiritual gifts, but you know where it really begins? Verse one and two, that death, that sacrificial death that needs to take place, that puts us in a position to be useful to the body of Christ. This puts you in a position to bear fruit. I dealt with the Galatians 2.20 principle last week, but that's the greatest key to victorious living found in, in the Bible. We go to die every day. And I'm talking about dying to every area of your life. You have your own agenda that you bring in to the prayer closet that needs to die. Your own plans. You have your own will. The Lord Jesus exemplified for us what needs to happen in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here is what I want, Lord, if there's any other way. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We need to have a funeral every morning, whenever your time is going to be, where we go to die and empty out our vessel. There is freedom found there, by the way. When you lay it all down, and you die, that's where you're free. Sometimes it takes an overwhelming challenge to get you there. We typically don't go there on our own because we're excited about doing it. But sometimes something in your life will get so overwhelming and it'll drive you to that death, that funeral service that needs to take place in the prayer closet. But it does need to take place at time to die. For the sake of time, I'm going to go into the time for filling, and then I'm going to incorporate some of these things here in a moment. I had a lot of stuff down here, by the way. We're just seeing what the Lord's going to bring out. But you need a time for filling. We empty out, but we need to be filled back up. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, it's hard to fill an empty cup. You need to die that you might be filled being filled with the Holy Spirit of God prepares us to walk in the will of God. To be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that prepares us for the spiritual battle that we could not face on our own. It fills us, He fills us, 
that we might walk in a way that pleases God that day and redeem the time back. We have such a short amount of time, it's a vapor. The Holy Spirit of God through our life redeems it for us. We need to die daily and every day we need a fresh feeling of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. Every day. This is where I put the whole armor of God on. To put on the belt of truth. To put on the breastplate of righteousness. To shod my feet with the sandals of the preparation of the gospel of peace. To grab my shield of faith. To put on the helmet of salvation. To pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Full dependence upon God and the resources He provides. Exercised through our life by the Holy Spirit of God. Greater is He what who is in you than he that is in the world. It's a reminder to be watchful when you do this every day. I don't know if it's going to be the evil day, but I know this, I'm not walking out of my house without the armor of God on to go for my filling. It's a part of the armor. This is also where you win the battle of sharing the gospel. Many people are afraid to share the gospel because in that moment, all kinds of things, well, I don't know what's going to happen, what they're going to say, but you're trying to make a tough decision in the moment when really you can make the tough decision and win it right here. This is where you go and you say, Lord, you put someone in my path, I'm asking you to do so, and right now I'm deciding right now to share the gospel with them. And you win the internal battle of making that decision here. Much like you would in temptation. You're not trying to make tough decisions in a moment of temptation. You make decisions up front. You resolve in your heart before they get there. The same thing happens with the sharing of the gospel. Hopefully you want to share with people, right? That's why you're here. I don't know if I had time for this, but I'll share a little bit of it. But I went, this was just here recently over Thanksgiving. From my own prayer closet, the gospel got to a guy right off the grid. I was just going with my dad to look at some land. Divine appointments are everywhere. In fact, after a string of days and you don't have one, it'll make you want to throw up. If you're about doing this, they're all over the place. I wonder if sometimes we're we're missing it because we don't have this part right here down. You'll be amazed of what the gospel will do through your life to someone else. And it begins right in your prayer closet, wherever it is going to be in your house. We need a time for intercession and petition. This is where the this is the battle. The prayer closet is the war room. That is the battle. Standing in the gap for others before the Lord, the lost. Genesis 18, 22 through 23 says, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Sodom is about to be destroyed by fire. But who's standing between Sodom and And God, Abraham, and Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he's pleading. He has this intercessory moment with God. And in that intercessory discussion, you you, you get the picture that, man, God will hold off judgment. But it takes someone standing in the gap. And then in verse 27 through 29, Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He went back to that place. And then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. When he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Listen to that phrase. It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered who? Not Lot. 
remembered Abraham. There's people in your life that are lost that need you to go before God and plead for their salvation, to plead for their lives. We do this on their behalf. And here's the deal. You came to Christ because someone did that on your behalf. It's the method God has chosen to use. Try to figure it out if you will. I don't know. I know this. We are commanded to stand in the gap for the lost and pray, and God does amazing things as we do so. Here's how, in this time period, you need to have people that are lost where you're praying for. You need to pray for your church leaders, your pastor. Paul says, pray for me also. In Ephesians 6, 18, verse 19, he says this. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says, pray for me that the Lord would give me utterance to speak the gospel as I ought to speak it. If you want to know how you can pray for your pastor here, you just, you just trade Paul's name out for mine. I'll, get, I'll take that prayer all day long that God would give me utterance to make plain the gospel as it needs to be made plain. Pray for one another. Pray for your church family. You have lists going around in your Bible study where you learn about one another's needs. You, you pray for them. But as you do so, you remember, we keep what's most important to God first before we come to our request. Pray for our missionaries. This, during this December season, a Christmas season, Lottie Moon, our Christmas offering. It's a way for me to emphasize that to you today, but also to emphasize praying for our missionaries, standing on the lines. I've developed a relationship with a, a missionary couple in Canada. I've talked to them this week, reached out, I said, what are, we're having a prayer service. What are some tangible prayer requests that we could pray for? Can you send them to me? And you will have a church in Sigaville, in Texas, who will stand on your behalf. Amen? Let's play this video, and you will hear and meet this missionary couple. We're, we're, like, we're Joe and Susan Benford, and we serve uh, with the International Mission Board, uh, serving you. And we live in Toronto, Canada. Our work is focused primarily on people who've immigrated here from South Asia. That's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and a few other countries in that part of the world. So we want to ask for your prayers, and we have a couple of prayer requests we wanted to bring to you. Uh, one is for a friend of mine named Halim, we'll call him. Uh, he is from Pakistan. He is here by himself. His, his wife and kids are still living in Pakistan. He's been here several months trying to uh, earn a living, and he wants to bring them over eventually. But he's been by himself. He's had a lot of questions. He's got some uh, issues he wants to talk about, and we've been um, meeting together, and I think God is working uh, in his life, and we want to pray that we can find uh, many more opportunities that we can meet together. So I just like, ask for your prayers for my friend, Helene, and my wife has a prayer request also. Yes, uh, another co-worker and myself, Christian, another lady, um, have started a group called the Chai and Chat Group. It's been going on for a few years now, and mainly Muslim women join us. It's all a women's group. And I just would like you to be praying for this group of eight, nine, ten ladies that come. We do this twice a month. And I just would like prayer for them as we go through this Christmas season to be able to share again this year about Jesus's birth and what Jesus can do for their lives. We want to thank you so much for all you do for us and for your prayers, but also we want to thank you, especially this time of year, for those who are, the churches are supporting us through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and the cooperative program. This means a lot to us because it allows us to live here on the field uh, and have a, a ministry present among those who are lost. We want to thank you so much for all that you give and support uh, for missions. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Let's pray for them right now, can we? Halim, pray for his salvation. And there was a Muslim group 
of women, and we're praying for their salvation as well. And those relationships are trying to be developed through a man named Joe and his wife, Susan. So we want to pray for Joe and Susan, safety, that utterance would be given to them, that they would make known the gospel as they ought to speak it without fear, boldness and courage. Pray for the work there. Pray for them and pray for Halim and pray for that Muslim Bible group. Would you do that now? Lord, we thank you for Joe and Susan, an ordinary couple, ordinary people just like us, but who are demonstrating what life looks like to be on mission. We all are to be on mission no matter where we find ourselves. And today we come before you to stand in the gap for Joe and Susan, that you would give them courage to get the seed of the gospel out, knowing that it is sufficient for salvation. Give them courage and boldness. Give them clarity that they would speak the gospel in such a way that they would hear, that this Muslim group of women would hear, would come underneath conviction that this is true, that Jesus Christ was born to die for their sins and was rose again on the third day and they can have a relationship with you and spend eternity with you and be saved from judgment in a place called hell. You bring them to a place, God, we pray they would cry out for mercy and we pray that for Helene too and we pray that you would answer that cry and that Joe's and Susan would fill these prayers today. Lay on our hearts today, Lord, what we need to be giving towards the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We're spending a lot of money on gifts. I pray we would match that in the Lottie Moon Christmas offering this year, that we give a worthy gift to you for the sake of the lost. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me finish by saying this. When you get through praying, you're going to realize that was a lot of work. It's a lot. It's a lot. You're tired. It's, it's labor. I don't know. It, it's, it's put that way in the Bible. It is labor. But I also encourage you to have a time where you're spending in the, in the Bible. I don't sermon prep during this time. I'm not doing any of those things. I've had sermons come out of this time, but I'm simply reading to feed my soul at the Lord's table. And you write down what he says. But concerning effort, some might think, well, this sounds like a lot like works. This is a lot of different things. It sounds like, man, we're just, we're just working here. Where's God's grace involved in all this? Dallas Willard has a wonderful quote. Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. We're not earning God's love by doing this. We're not earning a blessing from God by doing this. We're not earning anything. We are simply putting effort into the most important relationship that need and should be cultivated in our life. 
the most important relationship. The Bible is not opposed to effort either. There's a lot of scriptures on laziness I thought I'd bring up, but I thought, well. But listen to Proverbs 24, verse 30. Listen, this is good. I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. In no way is the Bible opposed to effort. If you have a flower bed at your home, you may not have a vineyard, but maybe you have a flower bed. If nothing in that flower bed is maintained, you know what happens? Weeds grow. Thorns grow. That's called neglect. That's what's, that's what's being pointed out in Proverbs here. If you neglect your relationship with God, guess what? That flower bed gets neglected. Just as one's progress is evident, so is one's neglect evident. It becomes obvious to other people in your life if you've neglected this area. Just like it becomes obvious if you put intentional effort in this area. I would just ask you today, what is your flower bed look like? What does your walk with God look like? Is there thorns and weeds that need to be addressed this morning? If so, let's not leave today without doing that. This is worth putting effort into. Has your walk with God been neglected? Well, maintaining a spiritual workout on a daily basis will keep that flower bed pristine and growing and fresh fruit that will bless other people's lives in the kingdom of heaven. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? If your walk with God has been neglected, has there something taken over your top priority? What has drawn your attention? What has taken captive your attention? If it's not the Lord Jesus, then just what is it? Whatever that is, here's what it's doing. It's causing weeds and thorns to grow in your life. To grow in your household. It may be high time to wake out of sleep and slumber. Knowing our salvation is getting nearer and nearer. Our life is a vapor. Time is short. Now is the day to address this. Today is the day. Maybe to get on your hands and face before Almighty God and deal with whatever has crept up into your life as the top priority and remove it, get rid of it. Some of you know you've been hearing what you've been supposed to be doing, but you're not doing anything with it. Make the effort, put in the adjustment. You'll find your fellowship with God being restored. As well as your effectiveness for what he's called you to do. Let's clean up our fields. Let's get rid of hindering our prog- what's hindering our progress. Let's return to our first love. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We thank you for speaking. We know that as we draw near to you, you draw near to us, and you reveal, you speak. And I pray, Lord, you would help us today. Give us the courage to overcome fears of the unknowns, to address the matter that's most important to you, our relationship with you. 
I pray that would become our priority and that it'd be evident among all who would gaze at our field. We give this time now to you. We ask that you would move and work for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you, as we have our last song here, stand to your feet. The altar is open if you want to come and pray as you feel led. Maybe there's things to address there. Please feel free to do so. Maybe you've discovered through this you don't have a relationship with God. The thorn that's in your life is, goes back to the curse of sin. That's what thorns represent. Jesus took the thorns for you so that you could have a way to have a relationship with God if you don't know him personally. And God is calling and speaking to your heart on that issue. I invite you to trust him, acknowledge your sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And your cry for mercy will be met with his salvation. As God speaks to you now, as we sing, you respond, you obey. God bless you as you do.